couple of shootings in America this week, and once again, the left is leaping all over them as a predicate to disarm law-abiding citizens nationwide, uh, which, of course, won't do anything but make things worse uh, in America. But for the details on all this, I want to turn to a man we frequently turn to. is John Lott. He's the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, and he joins us now. John, good afternoon to you, sir. Well, thanks for having me on, Vince. Good to talk to you. The, the the first one that the left is climbing all over is this Jacksonville shooting on Saturday where what it appears to be a racist man went and targeted a couple of black Americans at a Dollar General uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, killing three people. Uh, and since then, uh, we've seen, of course, the, the usual suspects all claiming that Americans need to be disarmed. Uh, what do you make of that story, and, and are there any lessons from it? Well, his original target apparently was uh, a local historically black college that was there. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, was a gun free zone. Uh, it was only because he came across a security guard there, uh, and that was only because some of the students uh, had gone out of their way to try to find the security guard when they saw this strange person there. So, you know, it was only lucky that uh, that this guy was being able to be chased away from that gun-free zone. Yes. At least where civilians were banned from having guns. But importantly, a a security presence dissuaded him from attacking that university. No, exactly. And and instead, he went to this dollar general store that was right near the the campus there. Um, I don't, there's one common feature for both of these attacks. Uh, It's not 100% clear for the Jackson one, but, uh, uh, these guys may have been banned from having guns. So, for example, uh, and yet they obtained them. Uh, the person who did the attack um, at the University of North Carolina was uh, was on a student visa, apparently. And if you have a student visa, you're banned from being able to go and have guns or ammunition. Um it's not 100% clear, but it may be also that the one in Jacksonville might have been banned. There's news articles that mentioned that he had been involuntarily committed to a hospital yes. uh, for mental health care treatment. And if that is accurate, the way that they've, dis- at least some of them have described it, uh, then he would have been banned in that case. That one I'm less cer- certain about. But, you know, this is something that, you know, they, they talk about and you're bringing up this question about disarming people. Well, you know, here we have these two murderers uh, who were, you know, may have been at least one for sure were it was illegal for them to have a gun and yet they obtained it anyway. Yes. You know, if you're you talking about the, the UNC shooter. Uh, uh, I see in a CNN report here, helpfully sent along by a listener, that he is a citizen of China and was in the United States on a visa, according to the district attorney, Jeff Nyman. Uh, so you're pointing out, uh, John Lott, that it was illegal for him to possess a handgun in the United States as a foreign national. Well, a, a foreign national who is here on a student visa, it would be illegal for him to have it. Got it. And yet he obtained it. And so the, the issue that you have here is you have, you know, you bring up questions about people wanting to ban American citizens from having guns. Uh, you know, the only people that you seem to really successfully be able to go and ban our law-abiding citizens who are willing to obey obey the rules. You know, it's about as difficult to stop people who are intent on committing crimes from obtaining guns as it is to stop them from buying illegal drugs. Right. And so they target the people who are most likely to comply, which are law-abiding citizens. I I, I mentioned um, Eric Swalwell's tweet in the last 24 hours. Swalwell uh, it said this, quote, ban assault weapons, buy them all back, choose our kids over their killers, he writes. And uh, I see a number of problems with this tweet. One of them is that the government never owned the guns to begin with. So I don't know what buy them all back means. Uh, and additionally, right. this sounds like mandatory gun confiscation, kind of an Australian model that he wants to apply to America. Right. Well, you know, the Biden administration has been putting together a national gun registry. Uh, as of the beginning of last year, they had put together almost a billion transactions that they had computerized. And since then, that they've been trying to put pressure on everybody from uh, credit card companies to uh, UP, UPS and FedEx to keep track 
of uh, of you know these uh, uh, transactions that people might have with guns, so they can have a more complete registry. And it's one of the reasons why I think uh, the Democrats pushed so hard for universal background checks, because despite claims to the contrary, uh, you know, a registry doesn't do anything really to to solve crimes that are there. The only thing it's really used for is, is to eventually confiscate guns. And and as you know, you're indicating this wouldn't be a voluntary buyback uh, that uh, Swalwell is is talking about there. And, you know, if that's the case, uh, this registry would help them uh, make sure that they could actually force people to turn in the guns that they have. Right. Leaving the only people left with guns being the government and criminals. Right. I mean, look, there's been a number of times, not only in the United States, but around the world, where gun bans have been tried. We've tried it in Chicago. We've tried it in Washington, D.C. Uh, every place around the world that's banned either all guns or all handguns has seen an increase in murder rates, often very large increases in murder rates. Even in island nations, which seem like the ideal experiment, every place from Jamaica to the Republic of Ireland to the U.K., that's tried to ban all guns or all handguns has seen an increase uh, in murder rates every single time. And it's the point that you're just making about who obeys these laws. If, if you pass a regulation, and a ban is just a simple example of this, that's primarily obeyed by law-abiding good citizens, you may take a few guns away from criminals, but it's, it's primarily the law-abiding, you actually make it easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. You would think at some point, if guns on net are bad, then they should be able to point to lots of cases, even at least one, where a ban has successfully lowered murder rates. So so this is interesting, and, and this is why I love talking to you. So you, you say that uh, all these countries that ban guns, what ends up happening is the murder rates actually go up. Do I, do I have that summary correct? Yeah. Every place that we have murder or homicide rates before and after the ban, uh, you see an increase in, in murder rates. Now, the left will argue, and has, I have heard them say this frequently, uh, that, well, when other countries uh, change their gun laws, impose restrictions, ban guns, their homicide rates, their violence statistics go down, they claim. Uh, yeah. And they, yeah, well, they, they, they do that frequently. What, what, what's the magic? What's the math that they're playing with here? Okay. Well, the one country that they normally point to is Australia. And Australia had a buyback in uh, 1996. Gun confiscation. About, yes. Right. Where about 25% of the legally owned guns in the country were, were bought back from the go- by the government or bought by the government. And uh, um, now what they do is uh, they really are misusing statistics. They're looking at a simple before and after average there. And what, what's the problem is, imagine you had a perfectly straight line where a crime rate was falling over the whole period, both before and after the ban. What you would or buy back or buying here, what you would see is any point along that line that you could pick the after average would be below the before average. What you'd really want to look at, does it fall at a faster or slower rate after the government buys it? Does it go? Is there some discontinuity? Yes. And in fact, what? In fact, what you find is that over the 15 years prior to the government buying the guns, uh, the murder rate was falling, and it basically stopped falling when they had the buyback. So if I look at it, it looks like, if anything, it did the opposite of what they wanted to do. But there's another major problem here, and that is they did buy back or buy a lot of guns at that point, but then people were able to go and immediately buy guns again. And by 2010, the gun ownership rate in Australia was actually above what it was prior to the government buying the guns. And and if they're right, then what you should have seen is an immediate sharp drop in things like murder, and then an increase over time as the gun ownership rate went up. And that's you don't see anything like that at all. If you look at something like armed robbery in Australia, in fact, you have the exact opposite pattern. There's an immediate sharp increase, and then over time, it begins to fall back down to where it was. And in terms of uh, murder and firearm murders and suicides and things like that, it basically 
falling before and then it stops falling when yes. they have uh, the buying going on. Now, meanwhile, the argument that I've heard Joe Biden make a million times, as, as nonsensical as it is, is that nobody needs an AR-15. Deer are not running around wearing Kevlar vests. That's the argument he makes. And he's, it, he, in other words, um, he's making an argument that the only reason anybody would own a gun is for some limited home defense and for hunting and for sports shooting. Uh, but that's it. Um, how do you assess that question? Look, about 85 percent of the guns in the United States are semi-automatic guns, just like the AR-15. It's, the AR-15 is, is identical to any semi-automatic small caliber hunting rifle firing the same bullets with the same rapidity, doing the same damage. Uh, it's just how it looks on the outside. It looks like a military weapon, even though the inside functions of it exactly the same as any small caliber semi-automatic hunting rifle. And to go and ban guns based on how they look rather than how they function just doesn't make a lot of sense. Look, if Biden, Biden many times has talked about banning all semi-automatic guns, and if he wants to ban about 85% of the guns that are out there in the United States, make his case for that, okay? But the thing is, civilians benefit a lot from having semi-automatic guns. If you were to ban all semi-automatic rifles, um, what's left over? You have manually loaded guns where after you fire a round, you yourself have to physically put another bullet in the chamber. And that takes time. So if you're facing multiple criminals or you fire and miss or you fire and wound but don't incapacitate the attacker, a civilian using a gun defensively may not have the luxury of time to be able to go and manually reload his gun. This yes, but but you know. what, there's one other element here, though, which is that, that Biden constantly leaves out the or to the extent that he talks about it at all. He, he says, well, the government has, you know, F-16s, so you couldn't stop the government. But he constantly leaves out the rationale that the founders had for the Second Amendment was a defense right. against tyranny, including the excesses of our own government. Uh, you know, the Virginia Constitution lays this out even more explicitly than the United States Constitution, saying that the a, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural and safe defense of a free state. Therefore, the right of the right. people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, lost in so many of these debates is the intrinsically American pro-liberty ideal of of weapons as a barrier to tyranny. Well, look, you look at the American Revolutionary War. The first shots that were fired were Lexington and Concord. And what was happening there, uh, you had the British government trying to seize control of American guns and ammunition that was there. So, you know, the American you know, was very fresh in their memory about how a government had tried to see uh, the arms that the Americans had there to control them. In fact, one thing most people don't know, police departments were banned in colonial America by the British because the British were afraid that a police department was only one step away from having an armed uh, army that was there. And so, uh, in fact, a lot of places, New York City didn't have a police department until 1845. Um, you know, basically, you had civilians that would go and get together and arrest people and then go and take them over to, you know, the courthouse that was there. But, uh, you know, it's look, I look at surveys. The, the main reason that most people own guns today is security. You know, police are important. Anybody who's read my academic work knows that I think police are the single most important factor for reducing crime. But if you look at surveys of police, the police themselves know that even though they are important, that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And the question is, what should people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And yes. My reason. Research convinces me of anything. There's two groups of people who benefit the most from owning guns. People who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly. You know, they're almost always talking about young men doing the attack. And, and people who are the most likely victims of violent crime. And that overwhelmingly tends to be poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. You know, Democrats claim that they care about women, that they care about minorities. 
And yet we live in a weird world where they're making it incredibly difficult for law enforcement to do its job. And they also want to make it impossible for people to be able to go and defend themselves when the law enforcement's not able to be there. Yeah, yeah, it's all very revealing. Uh, thank you very much, as always, John Lott from the Crime Prevention Research Center. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate your time today.